you so much, Chris. Thank you, Heroic. And thank you, each one of you, for being here with me today. I really appreciate you taking time for your busy schedule to be here. So let's kick off with a question. How many of you woke up today, this morning, and your first thought was, I'm a bold person. I'm ready to make bold moves. I know what that means. <laughs> OK, two of us. OK, this is good. Well, I promise you guys, by the end of the day, I'll share with you a recipe that really can get you to make bold moves every day in your life. Because what I bet is many of you are feeling what I hear from a lot of my patients, colleagues, and organizations around the globe. Words like anxiety, stress, worry, burnout. Feeling like you've been skating on thin ice, and just a little extra weight would make that ice crack. And you're not alone. In fact, the World Health Organization has noted a 25% increase in depression and anxiety worldwide. And what does that look like? It translates to 60% of people saying that they're having work-related stress, difficult concentrating, irritability, feeling like they want to leave their jobs. And work-related stress does not stay at work. 80% of employees are saying that their work-related stress is affecting their relationships, the things that they care about the most. Let me share an example of what this looks like. Jake is a client of mine who I met a few years ago. He was in his second startup, and before I met Jake, he told me his life had been picture perfect. His first startup went really well. He sold it, made so much money that he theoretically could retire. But he decided to take on the second startup, a technology startup in Boston area. And he was married, two kids, worked on um, the PTO. He was really engaged in his community. But that's not what I said, saw when I met Jake. Jake was stressed and anxious. His startup hit major financial problems during the pandemic, and he was in crisis mode. And what did he do when he got into trouble at work? Any ideas? What do most of us do when we get stressed at work? Drink? Yeah, he certainly was drinking quite a bit. Has Work more. That's exactly it. Jake just stepped on the gas. He would stay in the office late hours. He felt like he, if he worked harder, his startup was going to be OK. The problem is, eventually, the weeks became months. His wife started to get really frustrated with him, feeling like he wasn't caring for the family anymore. Jake would come home and, as one of you already said, would have one too many drinks to manage that anxiety. Would stay up super late so that he could work a little more, but honestly, was just numbing himself out. By the time we met, his wife was at the course of like, either you get some help or I'm out of here. You are killing yourself in the process. And Jake just not know what to do. What he said to me is, just get rid of my anxiety. Have you ever felt that way? That anxiety just feels like so much. And he, all of the things that he used to do, he wasn't doing anymore. He wasn't exercising. He wasn't spending time with his kids. He wasn't going on vacation. He was trying to just overwork to get through it. And what happened is Jake was just feeling so stuck. And what I said to him is what I'm here to say with all of you. It does not have to be that way. The reality is what I've seen in my research and clinical work is that we can become bold. And when we do, the opposite helps, happens. Our physical health improves. Our emotional health improves. We are able to work more productively and then less hours. And our relationships actually improve. Now, what does it take to become bold? What is the first thing we need to do? And the first thing we really need to do is identify the skills necessary to build a bold life. And to do that, we need to identify the real infection. Think about this as if all of you were a doctor for a second, and Jake was in front of you, and there was one thing, just one thing, that if you could fix for Jake, would make his life much better. What is the word that comes to mind? If you could take one thing away, what is it? Stress, OK? What else? Work-life balance. Work balance, so teaching him how to balance more. What else? Work 
anxiety, burnout. Any other ideas? Well, this is what he told me. If you take away my burnout, my stress, I feel less anxious, less tense, less exhausted. But see, those are symptoms. This is just a fever. Anxiety, although, is very, very debilitating for many people. Anxiety itself is not the problem. The problem is what we do when we are anxious. And what most of us do without skills is psychological avoidance. Psychological avoidance is anything that we do that gives us a quick fix, that makes us feel better in that moment, and therefore it works. Every time Jake had a glass of wine, he felt slightly better. The problem is, now he is in the brinks of divorce, about to lose his company, and being stuck farther and farther. What this looks like? Think about you and your own work. You come at work and something gets you uncomfortable. The anxiety goes higher, and what do we do? We avoid. We do something to try to make ourselves feel better, and that avoidance goes down. Jake was at the point that he was no longer even meeting with his teams. He'd come to work, his heart would be pounding, he had sweaty palms, and he would cancel a meeting, just saying to himself, you know what, maybe I just need to focus on finding better investors. His COO, by the time I met him, was so frustrated with him because she couldn't understand why is it that her you know, amazing CEO now couldn't function in work. And, and the reason was not anxiety. Of course he was anxious. It's what he did when he felt anxious. And the long-term consequence is really severe. What I've seen is that people get, they get fired, they change work, they get to places that are really difficult. So the question is, if psychological avoidance is the problem, why do we avoid? I bet some of you are thinking about your own avoidance a little bit, or the people that you know, your loved ones. If you think hard enough, why do you or your loved ones avoid? Fears. Fears. Absolutely. Fears is one of the reasons. There's yet another reason why we all avoid. Now everybody felt that. I could see that. If this lion was here right now, in this moment, what you just felt in your body is what your body is actually biologically wired to do, is wired to protect you. So your amygdala, the emotional part of your brain, would go on. Pretty quickly, what you all felt was this. Your heart starts to pound. The blood runs away from your head to your extremity. You start to feel dizzy, difficulty concentrating. Your pupils change. You are ready to fight, fly, and freeze. Now, did anybody feel that with the lion a little bit? At least from here, I could see it. I mean, several of you sort of jumped. I was like, okay, let's hold the people down a little bit. It's biologically wired, right? Our brain is biologically wired to protect us and to predict what's next. Some of you looked around, by the way. We're like, where is that lion once he came out? This makes a lot of sense. How many of you have heard of fight, flight, or freeze before? OK. All of us. Now, what happens when you're sitting at home? It's 10 PM. If you have kids like I do, you put your little one to bed and unfortunately go back to computer sometimes to check email, and you're in this challenging situation at work, and you get an email that says, we need to talk. <laughs> I can see it. The same thing happens, right? And because our body is biologically wired to move away from this comfort, right, we don't actually have to think about this. In this case, most of us engage in what I call the three R's of avoidance. Some of us will react, some of us will retreat, and some of us will remain. What does that look like? If you get that email and you react, like I do, you pretty quickly <laughs> take your computer and you go, I'm going to tell you this. You should not do this. And, blah, 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 blah. and I compose an email so fast, right? And I used to tell myself that I was being productive or um, assertive. Do you know what I was doing? I was running from my own discomfort. They may upset me. I was 100% on fight, flight, or freeze. And what did I do? I react. React is going towards discomfort with only one objective, to make it go away. Some of us do what my husband does, which is not to react, 
Some of us will just <laughs> walk away, retreat. So husband doesn't do the wine, by the way, but what he does do is this. If the email comes, I was having this conversation with him before I came, and he says, well, if the email upsets me, I don't open it. I'm just putting the other screen over here, and I live in the screen. I was like, you do what? Like, how do you not respond? He's like, oh, no, I don't respond. He walks away from this comfort, right? His way of managing his avoidance is walking away. And for some of us, it's just a deer in the headlight. You stare at that computer screen, you have no idea what to do, and you're just frozen. So, and when we do this, what happens? The opposite of a bold life. We're going to have problems in our bodies. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with that comes in because they have physical pain, but the physical pain really is because they're avoiding anything that's good for them. Or mental health. Anxiety is on the rise, and one of the reasons is because people don't know what to do when they're anxious, right? Psychological avoidance is the problem, not anxiety. Some of us have trouble at work and, of course, in our relationships. So before we talk about how to solve this, I'd love for you guys to just look at the folder you have in your hand. There's actually a handout in there that has several flavors of avoidance. React, retreat, and remain. It's in the back of that page. And just for a second, scan through it and look at it and think to yourself, what is my primary flavor of avoidance? Now, we all do all of them, but when you have discomfort, how do you deal with your own discomfort? I love that people are laughing. That means, that means we do some of it. I, I'll, as you guys are scanning, I'll tell you, I react for many years, that's the only thing. And some of my reactivity actually looks so good to the world, I would like be so productive and then I, I'd be so sick because I was working all the time and never stopping working. Now I see some of you paused looking already. Is anybody brave enough and willing to share their flavor avoidance? Here we go, just one second. We're gonna get a microphone to you. Thank you. I love when people engage in conversations. Uh, I'm definitely noticing that mine is retreat. Retreat. <laughs> so you, you've tried to move away as much as possible. Yeah. Awesome. Any other flavors in here? I definitely let emails pile up and basically procrastinate more and more. Retreat. So procrastination is certainly one way to get yourself stuck because the more you procrastinate, the more you avoid, the more you avoid, the more anxious you feel, the more you procrastinate. Next thing you know, you can't actually clean the emails. Awesome, thank you guys. So I talk about avoidance not as a Harvard psychologist or somebody that has treated people for 20 years. Now, I grew up in this little town called Governador Valadares in Brazil. And I grew up with a single mother and she had to raise my sister and I and it was really challenging at times. There's one particular day that's burned to my memory. I woke up and it had been raining. Our roof had been leaking and as I stepped out of my bed, I literally stepped on a mushroom growing. It was disgusting. It felt so, so much. That day, day crying, I begged my mom to not let me go to school. And what did I do? I sat in her bed and I ate these cookies. They're so good. But the problem was, this is the only way I learned to manage emotions as a little kid. I ate my emotions. That has led me with a lifetime battle with obesity. I fight it every day of my life. I bet my life would have continued to be this way had I not moved when I was 15. My mom sent me to live with my grandmother in a bigger city called Belo Horizonte. So I went from this little city where I felt comfortable to Belo Horizonte, and my brain basically decided that strangers were just dangerous. They're gonna laugh at me, they're gonna think I'm weird, I'm from a small town. That was the narrative in my brain. If at that point you told me I'd be on a stage with all of you looking at me, I'd be like, you're crazy. I can't even talk to one person, let alone being here. But the thing is, my grandmother knew science before I knew science. She asked me, why aren't you having friends over? I have to study, study is really important, I told her. She says, yeah, but you know, you used to have a lot of friends. No, no, I have to study. So one day, she took me to the mall. She invited me to go eat Chinese food. Now, growing up poor in a small town, I had never actually had Chinese food. 
I get to the mall, I'm so excited, we get this food, my, it's, my mouth was watering. To this day, when I eat Chinese food, I remember that first visit to the mall. <laughs> she looks at me and goes, let's go sit with the old gentleman right there. He looks like he leads a little company. What? <laughs> sit with somebody? Talk to somebody? I nearly panic. My, I, I get sweaty palms telling the story, no joke, because I remembered vividly that fight, flight, or freeze as a 15-year-old scared of people. She didn't take no to an answer. My grandmother doesn't take no to an answer. And we kept going and going and going. Today I learned, not today, but in graduate school, I learned that what she was doing was exposure therapy. She was forcing me to face my fears instead of letting me avoid it. So that landed me at SUNY Buffalo. I studied really hard. And you'd imagine I overcame my avoidance. Now I had the techniques, right? No, that's not how it goes. I wanted to get to Harvard. And my mentor basically said to me, listen, State, street, state schools, students don't get to Harvard. I was sitting in my office crying in the morning one morning, writing this essay to try to get into the Harvard postdoc internship. And I, like, I threw it out. I was like, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not Harvard material. For until the day that application was over, it was done, due, I avoided. That day, I remember my grandmother saying, if you don't try, you don't know. And so thankfully, I matched at Harvard, and I've been there for 15 years. And I'll share one last story with you that nearly crushed my dreams if I had chosen to avoid. I wanted to be president of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And it's a big association. And I was on maternity leave. They called me, and they said, listen, your name is up. They want to interview you. You're going to be running against somebody else. But we think you're ready to be president. And I remember this vividly, because I had a month-old baby at home and thinking, can I do this? And the night before, I went to dinner with a colleague, and a senior colleague, and she said to me, Luana, you're too young. You shouldn't do this. You really need to focus on your son. You're not going to be a good mother if you actually try to become president of the organization. You can't handle it all. Came home and wrote this email to the board to push my thing. I sat there crying to my husband, David, and David is looking at me like, but you want this. Since I met you, you wanted this. And I was like, well, but maybe she's right. Maybe I'm not going to be a good mother. Now, maybe hormones was playing a little bit in that day. But I nearly pressed end, and I'm thankful that I didn't. Because I became the first Latina president, the youngest president the organization had, and, and did it all during the pandemic and did really well. So I share this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now you guys are getting me a little nervous. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm really proud of it. It was, it, was a, it was a hard thing. So I share all of this so that I can get you guys to be bold. Are we ready? Yeah? Are we ready to be bold? All right. Three skills. Let's do this. Shift, approach, and align. In the next 10 minutes, I'll give you a very quick primer on the things that I use every day, including right before this presentation, to make bold moves. Shift. Shift is the idea that when Jake walked in a meeting, his brain was not working for him. Every time he had an anxiety, his brain would say things like this. And think to yourself, I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but have thoughts like this ever cross your brain. I won't be successful. My team hates me. OK, I'm not alone good. Um, I'm too anxious to perform. My initiatives are stupid. I'm a failure. And whenever Jake had any of those thoughts, his body went on fight, flight, or freeze. And the problem is he would interpret that as definitely confirming what he was saying to himself. And so what happens here? Our brains went on fight, flight, or freeze because we are an emotional brain. All of our thoughts are like we're wearing 3D glasses or magnifying lenses or fortune telling the worst. And the truth is, it's only that way because our brain is on fight, fight, or freeze. So to shift is to widen our perspective, to take away our blinders, and to be able to learn to talk to ourselves as if we're talking to our best friends. Have you ever noticed that we are really mean to ourselves, but when a friend of ours is upset or is having a breakup or is having a problem at work, you go, oh, you got this. I'm here for you. But we don't do that to ourselves. In fact, I don't think we'd have friends if we talked to them the way we talk to ourselves. Just saying. So to shift means widen our perspective 
And the way we do this is we actually activate our prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex is the planning part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that allows us to execute. It's the logical part of the brain. And when that part is on, the fight, fight, or freeze part of the brain actually quiets down. And we do this by isolating a single thought. Now, you can try it right now. If there is a thought that's been bugging you, just think of that thought. I'll never get through this. And you ask questions out of your thinking. What, are, what data do I have to support this thought? Or if this was my best friend, what would I say to my best friend in this kind of scenario? And see, when I asked Jake this, I would never get through this. He looked at me, he's like, well, I don't know if I'll never get through this. Okay, so now I'm magnifying. And I said, what, what are the data you have? And, and he looked at me and said, well, I don't have any, really. I'm doing the best I can. My first startup was extremely successful. And so far, I'm still in the game. And so when we start to ask questions of our thoughts, the idea here is activating the thinking brain, calming down the emotions. What Jake started to say to himself is this. I can only do as much as I can, and that's all I have to give. Now, that wasn't a happy thought, by the way. The idea here is not to replace thoughts, because thought replacement doesn't work. Let's try an experiment. I want you all really hard, try not to think about white elephant. Impossible. And see, when we talk about changing our thinking, often people are like, well, you're telling me to have a happy thought. Happy thoughts do not work. Balanced thoughts, data-driven thoughts. I do this every day. The way my grandmother taught me this is, is there another way to look at this scenario? And so every day, I woke up this morning, I'll share with you guys, I have this book at lunch, and I'm so anxious about this thing, I can't even tell you. Every morning, my brain goes like this. People are gonna hate your book, they're gonna think you're a failure, you're never gonna get a book deal, it's gonna suck. And every morning, I have to go, what data do I have for this? What can I do today? How do I control? And so shift is really this idea of widening perspective but it's not sufficient to have a bold life. The next thing you need to do is to be able to approach. And you remember, when we're in limbic system, it's impossible to approach. What did Jake do? Reschedule meetings, drank too much, stop going to the gym. The technique here is what I call opposite action. Opposite action is the idea that instead of moving away from discomfort, I want you to go towards discomfort. But there's a trick here. It cannot be all or nothing. No one can learn to train their brain overnight. So to choose opposite action, what you want to do is come up with a list of things, of ideas of how can I approach this comfort. So I talked to Jake about this, and he had canceled all meetings. And he said, okay, I'll meet with my team once a week. I said, well, I haven't met with them for three months. That seems a little hard to do. And, and we went again and again, and what we had got to is he really liked his CEO. She was frustrated with him, but he liked her. And so we decided that he was going to have five minutes meetings every other day with her, and they're going to be just check-ins, clear check-ins. Why did I do it that way? Why didn't I say to him, go meet with all of your team? Because that was going to cause so much fight or flight that he would avoid again. And so the idea behind opposite action is you go towards discomfort, but you go in a way that trains your brain, it gets your brain back to work for you. Finally, my favorite skill these days, and one that actually got me here with you guys today, align. Align is the idea that stress in our lives really happen when our values are not aligned with our actions. Values are the things that matter the most to us, ambition, family, Honesty. How many of you, if I asked you to look at your last week in your calendar, could tell me that most of your actions are fully aligned with your values? Four of us, five of us. That's fantastic. And when that happens, how do you feel? Better, I assume? Yeah, thumbs up. When we align values with actions, we feel much better. Now, there's two exercises I use to help you sort of figure out what are your values. Often, when people do this, they want to think about a values list. And although values lists are really helpful, I'm going to tell you, it's really hard to identify your values by just looking at a list. 
So there's two exercises, a sweet exercise and a sour exercise. I use the sweet exercise one with Jake. And the idea here is for a moment, and you can try this right now. Imagine a moment that really brings you a lot of joy. Imagine who you're with. What are you doing? What are you seeing around you? What are you smelling? And for a second, ask yourself, why is that moment so good? What's behind that moment? I did this exercise for myself when I was struggling with my weight. So I just lost 50 pounds, took a year. It has been a major endeavor. But I hit a wall, and I just couldn't get myself to the gym anymore. And I had to really figure out why did I want to go to the gym. And, and eventually, it wasn't just health. What got me back to the gym was this idea of connection and family. Because family matters to me, and I realized that if I continue to be 50 pounds overweight, I was cutting time for my life for my five-year-old. My heart um, wasn't doing well. And so really looking at a moment, and, and the moment I had with Jake was, um, we have a little gym at home, and he loves to go and dance to Latin music and exercise. He tells me he's exercising, and I, and I believe he is. And that moment, like every time I think that I want to go to the gym, I think about Diego dancing to La Bama. And I was like, oh, okay. And so this idea of thinking about sweet moments to identify your values. And for Jake, what he did is innovation. He created a startup so that he could have innovation, but he was feeling stuck. The startup, by the way, it was for a tech company for a, a better social media for kids. He was trying to create something that wouldn't create so much harm for kids, as we know Instagram and others do. And so what he did is, in his board, he created a junior board seat. He brought flesh blood in because he felt like if he talked to somebody at the age that he was catering to, perhaps that would lead to more innovation. Before we end, I want to share with all of you, being bold, it is not being fearless. In fact, right before I went on stage, my heart was pounding, and I was like, can I do this? Being bold is choosing to take a step every day towards the things that matter most to you. And I call it being bold, not because you have to do something miraculous or big, but I call it bold because if you're truly living a value-driven life, you are already living a bold life. And being bold and making bold moves can change the game. It is the reason I'm here today. So I leave with you guys with one question. What's your next bold move? Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you for um, jumping in and talking as well. So we have some time for Q&A. Um, if you guys have some questions, there's a card that you can actually ask a question if you want, or you can raise your hand and Mechanic can bring you a microphone. And I'm really good at staring at people. So I can just stay here, stare at you. You know, my grandmother made me do that. So you'd be a lot more fun if we talk than I just stare. But my tolerance is pretty good at staring, so. Questions? Comments, please. My microphone over there. Thank you. That's a bold move right there, if there was one. That was, that was my bold move, yeah, for the day. So ah, yes. um, my question is, is like, this is really wonderful stuff, and I, I haven't read your book, so maybe you answer this question there, but it feels like it should be being taught to people that were your age when you went to the mall with your, your grandmother, and it's a skill that you can adapt at that age. And as, as adults, oftentimes, it's a lot harder for us to make those changes or incorporate them into our habits are a lot uh, longer standing. So how can we get this introduced to children that are you know, 8, 10, 12 years old instead of most of us here are, are older than that, I think? Thank you. So great question. Um, two things. I'm going to talk about all of us, and then I'll talk about the children because I actually have an answer to that too. So there's this concept called neuroplasticity, right? Now we know we can rewire our brain. So um, give an example. I have a patient who is 90, 
who decided that she wants to change the relationship with her family before she dies, and she's trying to use the skills in the book so that she can actually change it. So we know we can actually rewire it. Now, you're right. It is harder as you get older, the same way it's harder to build a six-pack as you get older, right? So what does it take? It takes actually spending as much time on the skills as we do on anything that is something that you want to learn. So if at 50 you want to become a piano player, you can't do it by just going to one lesson, right? So you really can do this by practicing again and again. This is just gem for your brain. That's all it is. That, that's all it is. And if we spend half of the time that we spend on our physical health and our mental health, I think we would be living a much bolder life. Now, kids, for the last 10 years, I've gone from the ivory tower to the streets, and what most of my research and work is, is skills, not therapy. How do we think about little dosages of skills that kids can learn so that they can start to apply this and learn emotion regulation? So I've worked with high schools. I've worked with inner city organizations. So I train paraprofessionals, so individuals that have no training whatsoever who works with inner city youth to deliver the skills to youth. And what we've seen is in one organization, for example, that works with young men coming out of prison, if they practice one of the skills that I taught you guys, today they're 65% more likely to get a job. Now think about that. If they're in a job, they're not shooting somebody in the street. Right, so you're right on. What is it going to take to transform education, though? A federal mandate. We need the president to say to every school in the country, the brain is as important as sex ed. In fact, I did this um, summer internship for kids, and they came to my research lab, and they learned everything. And in the end, they're like, they tell us about sex ed, but they don't tell us how to regulate our emotions. How are we supposed to not have sex then if we can't regulate emotions? I was like, <laughs> you tell them. You're right. Um, so you're onto something really big and important. And it, now, that's why I talk to my five-year-old all the time. It's like there's this emotional brain and there's this thinking brain. And the other day he says to me, I'm on my emotional brain and you're not getting me out of here. I was like, you're right, I can't, only you can. You're absolutely right. So thank you for your question, it's a great question. Other questions or cards? Oh, here, another question here. I'm not an avoider, but I know others that are. Um, how do I help them? Great question. So. I get this question often, actually, in presentations when you know, you're more of an approacher and you either are a friend or in a relationship with people to avoid. A couple of things. One is creating the vocabulary around avoidance. Because you know, the way I'm defining avoidance is really this idea that you get a quick fix, but it gets you stuck. So can we first create vocabulary with our loved ones of like, this is avoidance, and can you give them an avoidance inventory and say, do you do those things? Right? Sometimes the first step is putting a mirror in front of somebody and being able to say to them, listen, this is avoidance. The other one, depending on the kind of relationship you're talking about. So at work, in a corporations, what I talk about is teams being able to sort of talk among themselves about avoidance. So, you know, and this happens often in organizations when I'm working with them. You know, I respond to email all the time, you don't respond to email. So I over approach, you retreat, and now those two people in conflict just because the way of managing the stress is different. So being able to say in an email to somebody, um, I really would need a response in 48 hours, right? as a way to sort of train the other person a little bit of the containment. The final thing, if it is an interpersonal relationship, it's not having tolerance for it. It's being able to say to the other person, I love you, but when you avoid, you're hurting all of us, and so I can't take this. So we have to figure out a different way to do this. Because every time we allow somebody that we love to avoid, we're in some ways hurting ourselves. Right? And so it's this idea of basically saying, it's creating a little sandbox. We're all going to avoid, by the way. Like, I still avoid. There are things that I avoid. So it's not like it's going to go away completely. We just want to minimize it so much so that it doesn't interfere and that it's conscious. So then that way, you know, when <laughs> the other day, what was it? I was in a plane about to take off, and I got this email that was so upset. So I screenshot it, sent it to my husband. The response, do not. Do not answer this email, that is avoidance. <laughs> and I go, yeah, okay, turn the phone. I had to turn my phone off because I was going to respond. I was like, ready. in fact, I was typing it when he texted me. And so, but he, was, he called me out on it. And I don't avoid often either, but that's sort of my flavor of avoidance. He called me out on it. And I was so thankful because it really saved me a lot of emotional turmoil because I'd have to clean it up after. Does that help? Awesome. Other questions? Here. Yeah. 
I have a child who is very much an approacher, and how do I teach him that it's okay to retreat sometimes? That's a great question. So that, that happens sometimes, that there are a way, and the, well, let me back up. Is your child an approacher to avoid the stress or an approacher just because that's the only mode? To solve a problem. The only way to solve the problem, has your project. So I would talk to your child about this idea that in life, there are two things that are very important, a gas and a break. And that whenever we're only on the gas, we literally run out of gas. And what does that look like for a child? You get angry, you get impulsive, you can't regulate your emotions. And how does it feel, I'd say to your child, how does it feel when you are feeling that way, when you're feeling stressed, when you can't regulate? Because often, when they're not in that moment, they can say, that didn't feel so good, right? And so teaching that what he's trying to do is just step on the gas, but then there is a break. And so, and, and ideally, as a parent, trying to identify when it's too far. Because usually a parent can tell, and then creating this vocabulary of like, I can see that we're about to run out of gas. Can we back off a little bit? This might be a break moment. And then, there's a good trick. Have your child figure out what they're going to do when they step on the brake. Because it's so hard sometimes when a kid just wants to do gas. When you break, what are you going to do? You're going to play basketball for five minutes. You're going to take a walk. You're going to do jumping jacks. You're going to take a shower. And give them some options. So I do this with our five-year-old. For every emotion that we have, we have a little book that says, you know, I'm angry. When you're angry, you can, what are the five things you can do to calm that anger? And the fifth one is the one that he always gets to choose. And so there are ideas of what he can do. And in that example, Diego, he finally says to me, I need a bath. I said, okay, you can take a bath. And so gas and break, you being the break, and that's the hard job of a parent, right? We have to be the break. But having them break before they're out of gas because that's when you pay a price. Does that help a little bit? Awesome. Any more questions? One right in the back there. So, for example, when you were talking about Jake and you were mentioning, like, the signs that you were seeing, um, not, work, not going to the gym, instead going home and having drinks, things like that, I feel those are fairly obvious signs. Like, if, mm -hmm. I, like if I had a friend and all of a sudden... You know, they were someone who went and worked out five days a week and, uh, you know, all of a sudden stopped going to the gym completely and instead went home every night and started drinking. I go, okay, there's something you probably need to talk to someone about. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and certainly that would be something where I could start to talk and say, hey, how's everything going, you know. Mm -hmm. But I feel like when I hear people talking and am even listening, you know, whether it's to podcasts or something where they're interviewing people, and especially post-pandemic and having gone through the pandemic, I feel like it's definitely not always <clears throat> that clear when you're hitting anxiety or depression. And a lot of people, I wonder, well, I figure that don't realize that they're hitting that because it's not a black and white situation. It's not, oh, I've totally stopped doing this that I used to love doing, and I've gone and started doing this that I rarely did or yep. haven't been, hasn't been a part of my life um, in that same way. Uh, where do you look, or what are sort of those in-between things that you're looking for when you're talking to either a, a new client um, or going out and just speaking to people and things that you're like, hey, these are other, you know, maybe lesser signs that something's going on that isn't quite as, um, you know, a red light or a yellow light in, in the front of your face? That's a, that's a great question. A lot of people may lack the insight to really understand what's going on, right? So there are a couple of ways to enter it. One of it is this, are you feeling stuck? Right? People, I've never met somebody that's really stuck in their life and maybe they don't have all the symptoms, but they feel stuck that they can't tell me they're not feeling stuck. Right. Another way to do this, are you living your best life right now? Are you doing the things that make you feel like you're in flow states, that you feel like it's really helping you? So, and the reason I went on that way is because the opposite extremes, right? And most of us are living somewhat of our best lives, not our best, best life. But when you exaggerate for people, you create what's called cognitive dissonance. Dissonance is when two things don't match, right? And so if they're really stuck and you ask they're stuck, they might be like, yeah, a little bit. But you're living your best life, they go, well, not that. 
And then when you create that little space there, that's usually when you can go in and talk about what are the things that just don't feel right. They're just not doing okay, right? And so it's the signs are things usually that our body tells us. So maybe you're eating too much. Maybe you're not eating enough. Maybe you're sleeping too much. Maybe you're a little edgy. Um, and if you start to sort of explore that way by that spectrum, people tend to understand. They stuck is the one I get the most mileage from. It's like, well, a little bit, okay? And so where are you stuck? And in what ways are you stuck? The other way is that we are mirrors for other people in many ways. And so it may be, somebody just said this to me. I was in another presentation, and, and she said to me, I have this friend, and like, she talks really fast, and she tells me she's not anxious, but she's really, really fast, and, and I got anxious just hearing about the friend that was anxious, that he's not anxious. And I said, have you ever just said to your friend, when we're talking, you're talking so fast that I'm getting anxious just talking to you? And she went, no. And I said, then perhaps that's what you should do, have you hold the mirror, and just say, this is my experience. So maybe you are not anxious, don't have to label it, but when you talk that way, I feel a little anxious. Does that help? How are we doing on time, guys? Should, yeah? One more? Ah, oh, here we go. Microphone right there. Hello. Hi. You touched on this a little bit, but perhaps you can further expand of how do you combat that inner voice or that conflicting dialogue with yourself of, Believing you can do something, and then the next minute, there's that negative Nancy. Hope nobody's name is Nancy in here, but the negative Nancy <laughs> on your shoulder that's telling you mm -hmm. the opposite. So there's this battle in the inside of, yes, I've got this, and then next minute, there's the negative thoughts that you have, and it's yeah. just back and forth. So how do you get rid of that? Yeah, so all of us have that voice. Um, there's no one in this room that hasn't had a moment that doubted themselves. The problem is when that voice is louder than any other voice, right? When you feel like, okay, I can't do this, and then the brain says, no, 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 no. And, and the brain is really smart because, see, whenever we have a thought that goes against our own, um, what's known as a core belief. So core belief is a belief that was formed when you're young by your family, by your culture. And that belief is the lenses by which we filter information in the world. Let me give an example of this. Growing up the way I did, my core belief that got formed is I'm not enough. And so my brain, to minimize any energy, wants to prove I'm not enough. So I get this major paper accepted, amazing um, journal. My brain goes, oh, we only got accepted because the co-authors are smart. You're not smart. Right? Because the brain is designed to actually prove those distorted beliefs. So I shared that first because the first step is to understand what is that belief that's there that's getting me stuck? Like, what is it? Is it, I'm not enough, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, I'm not good enough, right? This is sort of the underbelly that most of us have. Once you shed a little light on that belief, then the question is really working against that belief. And you can do it in two ways. One is really by challenging your thoughts. I, I'm, I'm not smart enough, okay? And I've done this with patients um, myself many times. It's like, okay, so, I just had a, a patient who uh, was finishing her PhD at Harvard, and she's like, I'm not smart enough. I said, yeah, stupid people really get into Harvard all the time, and they don't you know, get PhDs. It's just handed out. And she looks at me and is like, what are you talking about? I was like, no, no, I mean, I, I agree with you. And she's like, okay, so maybe I'm smart at work, but I'm not smart in this domain. And so then you keep asking questions of those thoughts. So you really want to be able to use data as much as you can. One of the things I did with her is define smart for me. What does it mean to be smart? Write down a list of being smart. And so every time your brain says you're not smart, look at that list and see, do I do any of those things? Right? This is an active exercise. To fight those thoughts, we cannot fight in our head. So it has to get out of our head. We have to write it down. You have to fight it by questioning it. The other way, which is the way I sort of do it, is because my brain can be pretty loud, I use approach. So whenever my brain says I can't do something, guess what? I'm gonna do it. And I'm gonna do it again and again and again to the point that my brain can no longer hold that equation, right? Because what you're doing is you're creating data. You're basically saying to your brain, I'm going to show you that I can do this. Now, 
If you do this enough, I can promise you, it gets so much easier. Today, it takes a lot for my brain to think I'm not enough, um, and it still does. But it's like very little voice, and pretty quickly I can catch and be like, I don't have to listen to you today. Like, I just, I, I literally just cape it out. Um, but it took a lot of exercise. But you can do it. All right. I have a question. OK. So we've talked a lot about um, the workplace and how it's changed. A lot of people working remotely. Um, I can imagine that it becomes easier to avoid when you're not, you know, in the space with your coworkers. Yep. What advice do you have for leaders, you know, to have these conversations with their employees and to, to see it when it's happening and then obviously to correct it when possible? I just keep hearing so much about mental health right now and it's, it's frightening. I mean, you gave some of the statistics, but um, I, I admire the work that you're doing because of this. I mean, we, these are conversations we need to have. So go back to the leader's question. Yeah. So thank you, Chris, for your question. It's really important, and you're right. So I'm working with several organizations right now that I'm training managers to actually approach the conversation of well-being and to have check-ins, because it was much easier if you were in an office before, somebody walked in and they visually look distressed. Because most of us can feel it. If you work with somebody and you see them all the time, there's this piece of like, wait a minute, something is off. But in the virtual world, it's become much easier to avoid that. And so I really have worked now with managers to be able to sort of say, we're going to have well-being checks. And I'm not asking managers to become psychologists. We're actually using the framework of avoidance of like, I've noticed this, this, and this. How are you doing? Right? And here, I, this is what you can do if you're stuck. But really actually opening the conversation because we felt that we can't fix it. Right? And I'm going to tell you, when it comes to mental health, the stigma is still tremendous. That's why I often try to talk about brain health. The brain is just an organ that needs exercise like your physical body. And so we need to be talking about how do we exercise our brains so that we can show up at work better, so that we can show up at home better. And leadership is so important there. Does that help? Yes. Awesome. So I think, one more question. I, I, yeah, we're good on time. I awesome. would like to know about your recent conversation with Mel Robbins. Can you tell us a little bit about that and when we might hear more? Yes. Um, so does everybody know who Mel Robbins is? Show of hands. Many of you do. OK. So this interesting thing happened. Um, I, I texted a bunch of my friends about this book coming out. And um, one of this was a patient I had seen many years ago. And I texted her and I said, hey, listen, um, we so great work with you a couple years ago. This book is coming out. Can you share with friends and family? And she goes, do you want to meet my cousin? I was like, sure. I don't know who your cousin is. And she's like, my cousin's Mel Robbins. Do you want to meet Mel? And I was like, sure. And so 48 hours later, I'm in Vermont in her house, and we recorded two podcasts. Um, I think the first one comes out in two weeks is what they said this morning. Um, they're not sure. But it's a conversation about transitions. The world is in a major transition. People transition jobs, lives, relationships. And um, she herself was in a major transition. Her daughter is about to graduate college. And she was talking about her daughter's anxiety and how her daughter is going to be so anxious with this transition. And I looked at her and I said, Mel, we are avoiding real time. This has nothing to do with your daughter. How are you feeling? Where were you when you graduated? And we had a very candid conversation about her challenges with her anxiety, her challenges with her own graduation, which was under a tree, puking, vomiting, because she was so anxious to walk on stage. And we're able to use the techniques to shift her and to be able to understand, like, yeah, her daughter is going to have her anxiety, but her panic attacks had nothing to do with her daughter's her own anxiety. So we'll be um, coming out in two weeks, and that's the next book I'm writing, Transitions. So if you're in transition, I'm all ears. I think we have Anyone time. else? We Any can take questions? one more. There's one more question. If not. Oh, you do? Okay, go. go for it. <laughs> um, Should be. I think the mic is off, Chris. Oh. That mic? It's on. Is it on? Oh, okay. It is on. <laughs> Um, question relating to the next generation and 
the influence of social media is having on the development and how that ties into you know, how we handle these situations. It seems like social media is definitely influencing um, and it's also leading to like different types of addictions and avoidances. And I just want to hear your perspective on, on social media and how it's influencing our next generation and children. So the data on social media is strong, right? There is some negative effects. It's not all bad, so let's start there. I, I have no belief that social media is all bad. Um, like anything else, if we go all in, it's no different than drinking. It becomes a problem. And for young adults and children, the problem is their brain's not fully developed until they're 30. So talking about the gas and brakes, they don't actually have a break. The prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until you're 30. And so adults have to function as the break for kids on social media, right? What can you consume? How much can you consume? What amounts can you consume? But I also think it's an opportunity for conversations about what they're seeing and what they're experiencing and how to help them. Because we're not, the same way we're not gonna take bullying away completely, we're not gonna take social media away completely. So it's really about adults helping kids to moderate and find a way to engage it so it doesn't hurt them, right? And um, it is challenging though, you have a really good point. I was just in the call with the um, head coach for the wrestling team at Harvard and, you know, it was actually his question. He said, I have, like, in the last three years, since the pandemic is even worse, and now my wrestlers are on social media comparing themselves with everybody all the time, and everybody looks better. And see, by nature, our brain compares automatically, and unfortunately, we tend to compare in a way that people look better. And so we talked about teaching the team how to look at social media differently, how to think about comparison, understanding what comparison does to their brain, and then why is it that they even wrestling? Can we anchor on their values, not the culture values, not on social media values, as a way to get the wrestlers to feel more settled? So I think it's here to stay, and I think it's about conversation. Like anything else, we need to be able to engage with our next generation about how to consume this. The same way, by the way, we talked about them with drugs and alcohol, drinking and driving, sex. Like, it's just that this has a lot more power because it gives you a hit of dopamine without you actually having to have a drink. So, pros and minus. Pro plus and cons. 